Well, if you want to turn to the second chapter of the book of Acts, I'm going to share more of a topical message this morning from verses 46 and 47. And while you're turning, I wanted to note that I'll be reading it from the ESV, but I've been reading the NKJV for the better part of 20 years, so all of my further scripture references, if they sound a little bit different than what you're accustomed to, it's because that's what's ingrained in my mind is the NKJV. And so, yeah, we're going to be at Acts 2.46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple, together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray, brethren. Well, Father, we do thank you for this day. I thank you for that message my brother shared. God, I pray you help us to fix our eyes firmly on Christ, Lord. Lord, I pray that you take this message, Lord, and, and help it to bring unity in the church that we might stir one another up, God, more and more to look on to Jesus, Lord to be filled with love and good works for your glory and for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. All right, so the, these are somewhat timely passages. I, I had picked these out several weeks ago. Uh, but given all the talk of the revival that's been going on this past week, you know, throughout Acts chapter 2, you, you see such, you see the glory of Christ and you see the Holy Spirit moving among believers and when you ask someone what their definition of revival is, you can usually point it back to at least one thing here in Acts chapter 2 when Christians think of revival. And just previous to our text, there were 3,000 people saved and added to the church in a single day and there were legitimate signs and wonders and there was sharing of possessions and the believers were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and in fellowship and in prayer and they were selling their possessions. And there's all of these glorious things happening in that church that we see here. But I wanted to focus on just one aspect of it today and Really, it's the one that, that can seem the most insignificant when you look in our verses 46 and 47. And it's often treated as such. And it's breaking bread. And as the ESV says, breaking bread in their homes. The New King James says, breaking bread from house to house. And so you, you'll probably hear me use that term. I'm speaking right there of what the ESV calls breaking bread in the home. Now, the term breaking bread is used in different contexts in Scripture, the most notable of which is the Lord's Supper. When we all gather together on the Lord's Day and we share in it, everyone's pretty familiar with that. But Jude alludes to something similar. He, he speaks of a love feast. And then, of course, here in, in our verse in 46, they're breaking bread from house to house. And I'll start and I'll say there's no consensus among Bible commentators of exactly where you draw the line between the Lord's Supper and the love feast and breaking bread from house to house. However, there's one thing we can see clearly here in verse 46. It says that day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. So this this breaking bread in the homes we know is distinct from the public worship that was still taking place at that time at the temple. It, it's something different. And it was not 3,000 people gathered in one house taking the Lord's Supper and moving to the next house, obviously. We're looking at something that's, that's uh, speaking more of smaller groups here. And that, that's a foundational point I wanted to begin with. And... Uh, yeah, and, and Charles Spurgeon noted regarding these early believers that we're speaking of right here. He said they did not think that religion was meant only for Sundays and for what men nowadays call the house of God. And he goes on to say their own meals were so mixed and mingled with the Lord's Supper that to this day the most cautious student in the Bible cannot tell when they stopped eating their common meals and when they began eating the Lord's Supper. All right, 
I, I know in this church, there's plenty of brethren. You, you practice this. You fellowship and you break bread from house to house. But I also know I, there's plenty that do not do this. And you come maybe from a different background or a different, different church that doesn't practice that. And the reality is, even in churches that put a very high premium on doctrinal unity, you'll find, because we searched for churches when we moved here, you'll find very few that put a high premium on the relational unity that we see in the New Testament and in the book of Acts. And that's very evident, actually, just in the fact that there's not a lot of fellowship in these otherwise sound Bible-believing and teaching churches. And so for this is nothing new, my goal is specifically to encourage you that your times of gathering over a meal for fellowship with the brethren would be both more meaningful and more fruitful. And for those who, who this, this is something new to you since you've been coming to this church, I wanted to show scripturally from scripture how foundationally important this is to the church and that it's not an optional accessory on the Christian life. So I'm, I'm gonna go through several, several scriptures here, brethren, and if you really like to turn pages fast, I just either go to Luke 22 or John 17 and I'll, I'll meet you there eventually. But I, I just wanna briefly go through several scriptures and look at this topic of breaking bread in general. And as I mentioned earlier, the most prominent example is, is seen at the Last Supper where the Lord Jesus, and that's in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our very Savior typifies his atoning death the sacrifice, the substitutionary atonement of what he came to accomplish to reconcile us to God in relation to a meal, in relation to bread and wine. And, <clears throat> don't have my water, but it extends beyond the Lord's Supper because a short while later in Luke 24, 30, if you're already in Luke, after the resurrection, he reveals himself to just a couple of disciples in the breaking of bread. If you remember the story, he walked, thank you, brother. If you remember the story, he walked on the road with just a couple of disciples. This is not a church gathering. And their hearts burned within them as he opened the scriptures. And they invited him inside. And it says in Luke 24, 30, it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. Excuse me. <clears throat> and in case you think that's inconsequential, that it just happened to be dinner time, it was just purely circumstantial that those events unfolded, there was no special intent in the Lord in opening their eyes over breaking bread, don't turn there, but I'd, I'd read Revelation 3.20 where the Lord's word, words to the lukewarm church are, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. And him saying that I'll come to you and I'll dine with you is him saying I'll come and have intimate fellowship with you, a fellowship that lukewarm Christians were not presently having with him, a type of fellowship that's not on the surface. It doesn't come from just coming and attending church meetings. It doesn't come from casual Bible study. It comes from intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And brethren, we see that he's using this picture of a meal to describe intimate fellowship again and again and again. And time doesn't permit me to go through a more exhaustive list, but you'll find that breaking bread is first of all used throughout the scriptures to represent a place of the most intimate fellowship between the Lord and his people. We even see it in the Old Testament when David invites Jonathan's son to feast at his table continually. Jonathan's son, a cripple, he takes and he invites him to the king's table and that typifies what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And brethren, more than that, 
More than that, we're going to see it's also the Lord's desire for us to have that type of intimate fellowship together. It's foundational to the Christian church. The Lord Jesus said in John 17, for those who did go there in verse 3, that this is eternal life to know him, the one true God, and Jesus Christ who he has sent. And of course we know that that word to know God, to know, is something much deeper than surface knowledge. It's this intimate relation with him. And what's interesting, he goes on there in 17, in, in verse 11, to pray to the Father that we his people might be one as they are one. And in verse 23, so that the world might know that he came from God. And so Christian fellowship and Christian intimacy in the church is tied completely back to our individual intimacy with God. And there's a quality in it, an intrinsic quality that the world might know that he came from God. And so brethren, to go back to our, our our Acts chapter 2 verse. Day by day attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. This breaking bread from house to house is a setting for and a means to have fellowship in the Lord with each other and to really get to know each other as brothers and sisters. It's a setting to stir one another up in good works Brethren, we just saw in the John 17, the Lord Jesus desires this. It's fulfilling the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ himself that we had intimacy with him and with the Father and with each other so that that intimacy and that unity which is formed from it will be a testimony of the Father and the Son to the lost world. And that's exactly what you see here in Acts chapter 2. That's exactly what you see. You see that they are breaking bread together and that they're joyful and it's a joyful, wonderful thing, rejoicing in their salvation, rejoicing with the brethren and that the Lord is pleased to add daily to the church those who are being saved. And I, I want to make one side note too relevant to this church. You'll see there that there's a perfect harmony between having an outward-focused church and an inward-focused church. You see in Acts, the gospel is preached and people get saved and those people join the Christian fellowship and they're breaking bread and, and they know each other intimately and then through that witness and through the continued preaching of the gospel, more people are getting saved, brethren. It's not at war. Christian unity and an inward focus is not at war with the advancement of the gospel. It's actually a means to it. They strengthen and, and support each other. And, and I do want to do this just, just because I know there's brethren with very strong reform backgrounds here and some might still not be convinced that breaking bread from house to house is necessary and profitable and something we should be doing today still. And one argument for that is you could say there, there's no imperative command to do that. There's no, there's no direct instruction for us to break bread together beyond the Lord's Supper. And that may be so, but you know what there certainly is instruction for? 1 Peter 4.9 says to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Romans 12.13 says to be given to hospitality, which is better translated to be pursuing hospitality. Hospitality, a warm affection expressed towards guests and strangers. Brethren, inviting, inviting other people over for a meal, inviting the saints over for a meal to fellowship is absolutely one notable way that hospitality is shown. And I also know it's popular in some reform circles to actually dismiss this entire chapter of Acts as being merely descriptive and not prescriptive. To say that they're only sharing meals because there were so many new converts from out of town for the day of Pentecost. Well, that is one aspect of it that we're seeing here. If you think like that and if you're listening to teachers that are trying to get you to explain away all of Acts chapter 2, I'd caution you to be very careful. There's, even in the breaking of bread is something as what we'd think of as insignificant of this. There's a very much deeper principle here in regards to opening our homes and sharing meals and communing together as brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, I want to get to some practical applications and encouragements. 
uh, specifically for those who are already practicing this type of hospitality and opening their homes. Brethren, keep it up and don't grow weary in doing good. You invest yourself in this in people's lives and people leave the church and sadly people even leave the faith and walk away from the Lord Jesus Christ and it is very discouraging. Very discouraging, but take heart. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God himself, God, is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Brethren, continue, continue to promote unity in the church. Continue to advance the gospel through the fellowship of the believers for the glory of Christ if your main goal is to get the enjoyment of the fellowship as your primary goal, you're going to be crushed when people fail you. But if your main goal is the glory of Christ and the advancement of his gospel, then you'll be able to endure this with such exhortations as he gives us. All right, two. Again, breaking bread, when you think of revival, it's probably not the top thing that, that's jumping out to your mind. But we've seen and, and we see it's of tremendous value. I, I did want to share a personal testimony here. When we visited this church to consider moving here from out of state, we sat in that back corner. We listened to good preaching. I come from having listened to good preaching for many, many years, so I wasn't in need of that as my sole basis for moving. And I thought, well, praise God, nice church, good preaching not feeling led to move here. And we were getting up to, uh, to walk out that back door and to head back home and never to come back to San Antonio. And Jonathan Saguinetti stops us. And Jonathan Saguinetti, we find out we have a common missionary friend from the past. And he's like, I'd love to invite you over my home, but I have to work pretty much a double with just eight hours in between that I need to sleep. And then he gets my number, and by the time we were in the car, he called me, you know, brother, please come over our house. I'm going I'm to sleep for five hours, and I'm going to set aside three hours to fellowship with you. And they brought us in their house, brethren, and they served us a meal, and we had fellowship, and I met Hunter there that night, actually. And Megan made the special Peruvian dish with this green sauce. And she had never made it before. She had never made it before. She just wanted to try it. Actually, the Lord put it on her heart because where I was leaving to come here for the sake of my family was my two closest brothers in the Lord, what, what Titus was to Paul, my dearest brothers. And on our Tuesday night men's fellowship and prayer meeting, we used to go to this Peruvian restaurant and it's the only time I'd ever been there was when these brothers started taking me there and they had this really phenomenal green sauce. I have no idea what it is. I'm just calling it green sauce. <laughs> and brethren, brethren, and they encouraged us. They said, visit other families and, and the Wilkinsons and the Smiths and others. And we came back and visited and they brought us in their homes and we moved here. And my son was recently saved here by God's grace and baptized here. And you can follow that chain back to Jonathan Sanguinetti forsaking sleep to show hospitality and to break bread with a stranger. And you can take it back to Megan being led by the Spirit of God to make Peruvian green sauce that caught my attention in such a way I thought maybe the Lord's in this. And if you don't think that the Lord can do that, that the Lord is not in these details of hospitality of a mother who's changing diapers and, and taking care of the home, brethren, then, then you're going to miss this. You're not going to value it. You're not going to value the gift of God that's being given through these believers who extend hospitality here, and there's many more who I've, who I've mentioned. Three, because we're running out of time. Treat it like the ministry that it is. Those of you who do this, the Lord really convicted me of this some months ago. If I'm going out to preach at Haven for Hope or somewhere, I'm going out prayed up. I'm not just going to walk out there after a day of work with no time in prayer and just stand before men such as that and preach, preach the gospel. And brethren, I got convicted. I was, I was treating these times as very common and not as a type of ministry. And one day when the Lord convicted me of this, 
I spent extra time in prayer and the Lord brought two brothers together who I didn't know they had any relationship in the church and there was something that needed to be dealt with between them and they spent, they went out on our front porch and were out there till midnight talking and praying, fellowshipping and the Lord was in it and the Lord's pleased to use this type of ministry and I've got, I got one more encouragement I want to give that's really on my heart too being somewhat newer in the church. Uh, those of you, you're not feeling connected to the brethren. Or those of you, you don't know what your spiritual gift is and you don't know how to serve the body. Th this is a very simple place to start, brethren. Invite others over to your house for a simple meal and fellowship and eat, break bread, maybe share your testimonies or, or what the Lord's doing in your life and then play a game of Uno with the kids. It's that simple and it can still be edifying and have spiritual value and build us up in Christ and be a testimony to the world of his glory. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that word Hunter shared. Oh, Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Lord, and help us to be given to stirring one another up, to pointing each other to Christ, Lord to be communing deeply with you and each other, Lord, for the strength of the church and the advancement of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.